So let's keep talking a little bit about evidence of these feature varies. And um, I would go ahead and say that some additional evidence that we have does relate to the fact that we do have areas of our brain, cells and networks in our brain that are designed to respond to different features, such as movement, certain lines of orientation. So please make sure that you read about these in your textbook on pages 37 through 38. So let's talk a little bit more about how top-down processes like our prior experience, our knowledge, and our expectations also help us um, perceive patterns and things like that. So feature theories are generally based on bottom-up processes, but top-down processes help us out too. So we're going to try an example. So I just briefly flashed something for you, so I'm going to try that again for a second. Okay, were you actually able to see that word? Odds are pretty good you might not have. Did you see the letter K in there though? Or E in this particular case? Now what about there? Did you see the letter R? So let me show you, um, let me kind of show you these words. I'm going to close out for a minute. I gave you the word makeshift, and then I gave you this string of gibberish. Now, research actually shows that it's sometimes easier for us to identify a pattern when that particular uh, letter forms a word rather than when it is a random string. So odds are pretty good you had an easier time seeing the E in makeshift rather than the R in this string of letters. And this is what's known as the word superiority effect. And this is the finding that it's much easier for us to identify certain patterns when it forms a word. Now we're going to take this one step further. So we talked about templates, we talked about patterns, we talked about features. Now we're going to talk about how we recognize objects in general. So one of the things that's kind of tricky about object recognition is that objects can vary in their features. What you're looking at are a bunch of different types of chairs. So odds are pretty good you've seen chairs that look like this, chairs that look like this, this, our cute little Snorlax friend, one that looks like a hand. And here's what's interesting. All of these are chairs. Some of them have certain features, others do not. This one has armrests. This one does not. This one is rounded. This one is much more angular. So what is going on here that we're able to notice that all of these are chairs? Now, why is this so important? Why is object recognition so important? And the reason for this is because the goal of cognition is to act upon objects in the world. And if you want to be able to interact with an object or act upon it, you actually have to be able to identify it. And so we're going to talk about two major theories of object recognition. We're going to talk about Mars computational model from 1982, and we're going to talk about Biederman's recognition by components theory. So Mars computational model is basically the idea that object recognition happens in a, a series of stages, and each representation becomes increasingly complex. So the first thing we're going to see is what is called a primal sketch. So anytime that we're looking at an object, the first thing that happens is a two-dimensional description of just light intensity changes. So this is when we start doing that low level, looking at low level features. We look for edges, we look for contours, and we look for blobs. From that, we then proceed into what Marr referred to as the two and a half D sketch. So we've gotten the basic object edges, we've gotten the contours. At this point, we start thinking more about depth and the orientation of surfaces. So that will include things like shading, that will include things like texture, and that will include things like motion. And then finally, we get our three-dimensional model representation, and that's when you actually get the 3D object shapes. Now, what's really critical about Mars framework is that he had, um, this is what he termed as viewpoint invariant. 
What this means is that no matter which way you are viewing an object, your recognition ability of it never changes. So you should be equally able to um, identify a car, whether you're looking at one straight on or whether you're looking at it from a side view. So here's what this looks like. So here's our two dimensional sketch. Then you see, um, then you see our two and a half D sketch. And then finally you get that three dimensional representational sketch. So why is this model so important? First of all, it's the first one to acknowledge complexity in object recognition. Prior to this, people said, oh, object recognition? Oh, that's so simple. Nobody has a problem with that. It's way too easy. How can we even break this down into a model when it's so, so simple? So it's, it's the first one to really look at the fact that it's much more complex than we give it credit for. Additionally, it is one of the first comprehensive computational frameworks. So I presented this to you in a more basic oversimplified framework, but this was truly a computational model and that really inspired other people. Now, additionally, the other reason that this model is important is because it starts to set up an ongoing debate about whether or not object recognition is viewpoint invariant or what we would call viewpoint dependent. So now we're going to move on to Biederman's recognition by components theory, which was really designed to be an extension of Mars original framework. Now, the major assumption of um, Biederman's theory is that all objects are going to be made up of 36 basic shapes, which he termed geons. Geon in this particular case stands for geometric ion. It is something that is the most basic level of geometry. It cannot be broken down further. So of these 36 shapes, here are six of them for you. So here is the example of a cylinder, a cone, a pyramid, a horn, a football, and what he termed a wine glass. So here are a few other examples. And the idea behind this was that if you wanted to figure out what an object was, you had to be able to identify the different geons that made this up. So here in this example, we have uh, a pyramid that's been sliced up on top, a rectangle, a cylinder, um, a cone that's basically had its top locked up, and a tube. And you can actually see in all of these cases how these geons can be combined and recombined to create any potential object that we could see. Now, what are the key steps of this theory? So the first thing that we're going to find, the first thing that you have to do in Biederman's theory is determine where the edges of the object are. So again, with object recognition, edge, figuring out the edges where one object ends and the other begins is going to be the first and most vital step. Following that, two different things are going to happen. First of all, we are going to look for areas that are concave, that are bending inward. It turns out that it's much easier for us to identify an object when we are processing areas that are concave and moving inward rather than convex and moving outward. Additionally, we are also going to retrieve invariant properties of the object. Biederman included things like points that are lying on a curve or lying in parallel, lines or edges that terminate together. He referred that, uh, to that as co-termination, looking at things like symmetry and collinearity lines that are falling on the same plane. From parsing concavity and these invariant properties, you can then determine the components of the object. You can determine the geons that make it up. And at that point, you can then match it to its final representation. So what evidence do we have that concavity is really important? It turns out that um, Leaf and colleagues back in 2012 found additional evidence for the fact that if you, um, your eye movements are going to focus more on concavity rather than convexity. In addition to this, Biederman presented people with different types of objects where 
in this case, in this column, the areas of, a, of concavity have been removed. In this particular case, um, actually, I take that back. Here, areas of concavity have not been removed. Here, they have. And so what you'll notice is that when we only keep the areas that are concave and we get rid of the convex areas, the objects are easier to identify. When I remove the areas of concavity, objects are much, much harder to identify. Now, Biederman um, mentioned that like Moore's framework, he believed in viewpoint invariance. Um, and this is where we get into some of the biggest sources of debate. Viewpoint invariance is basically the idea that an object can be re easily recognized from all possible viewing angles. So what's this? It may take you a little time to figure it out, but it turns out that if I look at this from the side, I am looking at a racing bike. So Odds are pretty good. You looked at this for a second and maybe thought to yourself, wait a minute, that's a drone, maybe a robot, a weird construction thing, who knows? But as soon as I showed you this from the side, it became much easier to recognize. Now, if you had trouble recognizing this, that would basically mean that viewpoint invariance is not as infallible as it claims to be. Some angle, at, from some angles, it is, actually easier for us to identify objects than others. Viewpoint invariance says you should have identified this as quickly as you identified this. Now, here's the thing. Research has actually found that viewpoint only matters in certain conditions. Viewpoint invariance is more important for between category distinctions. So if I'm trying to denote the difference between a PT Cruiser and a Fiat, viewpoint invariance is going to become more important because we are looking at two somewhat compact, somewhat bubbly looking cars. In general, um, actually, no, I messed that up. Oh, it's been one of those days. Invariance is more for telling the difference between a bike and a car. In this case, we have to utilize more viewpoint dependence. This is a harder within category discrimination. And as such, you're going to have to focus more on viewing from certain angles. Because if you were looking at this from a certain view, it would be very difficult to tell whether you were looking at a cruiser or a Fiat from the back. But if you looked at them from the side, you'd probably be able to notice the difference. But if I'm trying to make a distinction between a bike and a car, viewpoint matters much, much less. Here's some additional evidence to support this. Cars and colleagues created these fake little three-dimensional objects known as greebles. Greebles are made up of heads that have three different types of structures. And as you can see, they're all different, as well as a central structure from the bottom. Now, you can see that many of these greebles look alike, but they have some important differences. Gauthier and Tarr, back in 1997, actually had people viewing greebles under various conditions. And they found that viewpoint invariance occurs only when the task is easy and they get feedback on it. These are very, very hard to distinguish from each other. They are probably viewpoint, or viewpoint dependent much of the time. I'm going go, to go ahead and stop here. We are going to talk next about what happens when object recognition fails.